and everything looked very exciting. It was all about inclusive Australian society and it was scheduled for the first two days of Pesach. Well, actually, the, the, Shab the Shab Shabbat before Pesach and Yonta. And there was a bit of an outcry that it was very hard to talk about inclusive society when you're excluding a large number of Jewish people who make a contribution to society broadly. Now, to, the, uh, to be fair to the government, I know that some Jewish people were asked what happens in Passover, which was in the diary, and they said we have a big dinner on the first night. <laughs> and they, because not necessarily knowing what they were being, why they were being asked. So there were, it was partly not the sensitivity, which happens with a new government and new advisors. So what did the government do? Well, it couldn't reschedule, it argued, because the administration was too far in place by the time the announcement was made. So a separate summit was called, where Jewish community leaders, I think uh, there must have been about 50 Jewish leaders, many but not all of whom would have been invited to the main summit, uh, were invited to a meeting where the Prime Minister and six senior ministers sat for half a day with 50 members of the Jewish community to talk about the future in working groups of about 10 people each. At the main summit, you couldn't get a group smaller than 100, which meant those who were good at uh, shouting loudly and leadership and taking over microphones dominated. Around the table in this working group, it was not only constructive, but it was a sign that the Prime Minister at least uh, took seriously a relationship with the Jewish community. I mean, think, think how extraordinary it is, that number of ministers, for that length of time over what most of us would say was airy-fairy stuff, you know, ideas for 2020 with no uh, <coughs> or policy implementation. As it was, the summit took place and Jews were still overrepresented as a portion of Australian Jewish community, of Australian society, even with the high census figures where we wouldn't be more than a half or three quarters of a percent at the very most, but we were well over a couple of percent at this summit, in addition to the 50, in addition to all those people who weren't either. And uh, there were no ill effects on that. <coughs> but the fact of the inv invitation, I think, showed that the Prime Minister, at least, wants to uh, continue a very strong relationship with the Jewish community. When, when I look over all, though, at the Jewish community, and I'm sorry if there's basic information I haven't covered, uh, and I'll explain. The reason I didn't go to cover some basic information is uh, some years ago, Manfred asked me to write a piece on the Australian Jewish community. I reread it this morning, and there are some brilliant sub editors and writers who work for this institution because it said things much better than I ever could, although it was above my name. And that paper uh, covers some of the basic material on which I've tried to expand in this presentation today. But the, the w one thing I want to conclude with is that Australia has been a very successful, the Australian Jewish community has been a su success story, I think, by any measure. Challenges remain, but I think we are thinking all the time about how to deal with them. One of the huge challenges we face is how do you deal with uh, the financial impost of day schools and aged care, and this sort of issue I, I haven't really discussed at all, but other <coughs> issues relate to how you maintain your identity and how you continue to have a strong relationship uh, between Australia and Israel, which I think is important on very many levels. The good thing is, though, if you look at the Australian coat of arms, what is the Australian coat of arms? It's a shield with a kangaroo on one side and an emu on the other. Now the reason the shield was selected that way is because the kangaroo and the emu have one thing in common beyond the fact that neither of them are kosher. So an emu might be, but try and catch it and to do shit here, it's impossible. Uh, the kangaroo and the emu, what do they have in common? Due to their muscular structure, neither of them can walk backwards. They can only walk forwards. And so we say in Australia, we, we understand where we're coming from, but we're always looking forward and looking towards the future. I think the Jewish community, who I'm told are officially known as Kanga Jews in certain uh, March of the Living Brigades or if nowhere else, the Kanga Jews in Australia are conscious of the challenges in the future and what we need to look at if we are going to make sure our community continues to be a success story and continues to the strength of the Jewish world. Thank you very much, Chair. We will now take questions. Uh, start with Easy Liebler, Hannah Givon, uh, Efraim Zorov. Uh, just a moment. Uh, Rabbi Shalom Bornstein. <coughs> Any more? Okay, that's to start with Easy. Uh, um, I would rather. <coughs> make one or two little observations, if I may, because Jeremy's given us an extraordinarily skillful presentation, 
uh, which I really want to commend. Very refreshing and an overall view. But I want to make one observation because it's quite surrealistic, really, the Australian Jewish community. When you put it in the context of all the other Western Jewish communities, it's quite unique, and there's an element of unreality about it. And I would like to say that there is no continuity about the Australian Jewish community, that the real break and the turning point came because of the post-war migration. And I would submit that before that, Australian Jewry was regressing, had become an Anglo-Saxon backwards of the worst order, very, very provincial and backward, was not Zionist, was not promoting anything, and was even hostile in many respects to the Jewish community. So the refugees that came in in 39, the first lot, and of course the huge numbers that came in in the post-war era. Now they were the ones who transformed the Jewish community because they brought this East European passion with them and what was important was that there was a tremendous battle within the Australian Jewish community which took place in Melbourne, not in Sydney. Sydney was kind of distant from it. But in Melbourne there was the fight between, the fight for democracy, as the Yiddish system put it, the fight to bring about a different order and to reject what they described as the Yahudim, who were described as the old Anglo-Jews. They won that battle and they put a pattern of life in Jewry that really has remained to this day, combined with their presence on the political and social and, the, and cultural field, which was tremendously important, was another element. Some of their outstanding members became very, very wealthy. The Jews who made it to Australia just before and after the war became part of an extraordinarily wealthy elite, and without their presence, the combination of the forward-thinking politics and everything, this unique relationship and unique influence that this tiny Jewish community has had on this country would have been quite different. And I think it's terribly important to look at that. The, the fact is that the Australian Jewish community, for, and to this day, is different from most other Western Jewish communities. And the real contrast is with the Brits. Because where the Brits, if I can quote my oft-quoted my oft -quoted expression, well, I believe that by whispering you get there much better than by shouting. The Australian Jewish community has always been upfront in all its political activities. This has had an impact on its youngsters and created a sense of identity which is quite unique. Now having said that, I would say that there's another factor that goes for Australia. And the other factor is the geographical isolation has in a sense put, us, put the Australian Jewish community 20 years behind the scenes. It's in a cocoon. If you look at Australian Jewry, it's like the better Jewish communities were 20 years ago. Although it's <coughs> rapidly changing and rapidly becoming part of the general world and the acculturation and changes and the memories of the Shoah and all these other factors that played such an important role, even the Zionism, in my opinion, will diminish and Australia will become different. But I think it's very, very important to have that central element of the impact of the newcomers on every level taken into account because otherwise it doesn't make sense. Thank you. Yeah, I think Izzy's comment's very important and I don't argue for one moment. The only thing I would add though is there has been the Australian Jewish community, when it was a, an Anglo backwater, was part of an Australia which was an Anglo backwater. Australian society was vastly changed with post-war migration generally and the Jewish community changed. It was part of a, a dynamic scene. In recent years, We've had Russian, Israeli, and South African main sources of migration to the Jewish community, and each in their own way are having an impact on our society. And one point is he made very strongly. One thing I've noticed with the Russian Jews who've been part of the community is they've been very unembarrassed about being upfront and saying what they believe. And that's been a very good contribution to a Jewish community which was perhaps becoming a little bit, a bit too comfortable to take a stance on some issues to do with Israel. The South African community. Uh, have a, uh, contributed a great deal of community sense, particularly in Sydney and Perth, and uh, if we want to go just across the Tasman, uh, Tasman Sea to New Zealand, to Auckland as well, and you've been seeing changes in those communities uh, which may have been uh, stagnating even with the input in the pre- and post-war years, and the, uh, even the, the Israelis, as they become more and more part of the community, are adding something else to the community. So we are continuing to be dynamic, although 
Mm -hmm. uh, that does not take away from the importance of what Izzy said about the changes in the Australian Jewish community. I was fortunate. I was born into a community which already had been uh, affected positively by the East European, Central European Jewish migration before and after the Second World War. And I'm watching what's happening now with the other waves of immigration. Uh, before the next uh, question, I just want to mention, Thomas brought up uh, copies of uh, Jeremy's, uh, Jeremy's uh, uh, essay on Australian Jewry, and you can take it here from the table afterwards. Uh, Hannah Givon and then Dr. Freimzor. I'd like to thank you very much for an enlightening talk. And I'd like to ask a question which I, which doesn't have to do at this point with the Jewish community, but may. <coughs> It appears, it, I seem to remember uh, that the Australian government issued a warning to, uh, I think it was the Muslim community, that they people had to abide by the laws of the land. And, and um, eventually, of course, this can impact the Jewish community there if, if, as happens in the United States, there's a kind of a subversive uh, cultural uh, takeover. Uh, okay, I'll just say, comment yeah. on that. As I'm often reminded, Australian's idea of multiculturalism is quite different from the, the way the term is used in many other countries. Yeah. And we are an immigrant society where there has been a... Uh, you, you basically can do what you like as, as long as it doesn't impact negatively on somebody, somebody else. That you won't necessarily have uh, uh, the government funding particular institutions. And, uh, not, the government is allowed to provide funding to church institutions and Jewish institutions, but it has to abide by the princi principle of access and equity. You don't do for one something you wouldn't do for another. And that's been part of our multiculturalism, but it's also been steeped in not rights and responsibilities. When Peter Costello, who was the treasurer and the deputy leader of the governing Liberal Party, made his comments about the uh, Muslims having to, uh, there was the Muslim community, having to basically sh shape up or ship out you weren't going to want to live like Australians, then, uh, then you weren't want to. It came in, a, in the context of a debate within the Muslim community about whether they were going to be responsible Australian citizens or they were going to be uh, seeing themselves as a uh, bulkhead for the eventual change of Australian society to meet their needs. Now, many, many groups of immigrants have come to Australia over the years, and you would say that none have sought to reshape Australian society beyond uh, shaping it in a way that allows you to comfortably live your life. So the context of those comments come in a society where it's accepted that you can be any religion and still be an Australian. It's accepted it doesn't matter where you were born, as long as you are going to be part of the Australian community and see yourself as having some uh, loyalty to the basic way of life in the country, whatever that might mean, you don't have a problem. The Australian government, around the time of that statement, also produced a change in our citizenship laws. Previously, if you'd been in Australia long enough and you wanted to, you could become a citizen. Now you have to sit a test. You have to sit a test of 50 extremely easy multiple choice questions that you can sit the test as often as you like. You can be taught, you can even have a translator sit there next to you and translate it for you. You don't have to be fluent in English to go through the test. But the idea was saying, know about the country you're becoming a citizen. And I think only one person didn't pass on the, uh, the first day. And, we, and I think it was harder to fail than to pass. But sometimes it is a matter of uh, not everybody has the same ability to remember multiple choice questions. And answers, I don't want to put that down. Not everybody has the same ability. But it seemed to be the problem there. Uh, one of the issues that came up is though the photo of the person in the newspaper, the first one to pass, he was wearing a Ustasha Croatian shirt, uh, which uh, made people think that perhaps our citizen chest should have addressed some other issues, or, or at least our clothing sale, or the photographer in the newspaper should have done. But the idea was not to dramatically reshape Australian society to exclude, it was addressing a particular issue in a broader context, which I think is far more accepting than any other country of which I'm aware. First of all, Yashukoch, uh, Jeremy, uh, for job well done. Uh, I apologize if you mentioned this previously before I came in here, but um, one thing is uh, the role of Australian Jewry in opening up relations with India, with China, uh, which was a fantastic contribution uh, for Israel and, and, and the Jewish world, if you say a few words about that. 
Uh, one other issue is um, on the surface, if you look at the um, religious communities, Orthodox communities in Australia, they're basically more or less like their counterparts in the United States, Canada, uh, Great, uh, Great Britain, but with one major uh, difference, and that is the overwhelmingly dominant role of Chabad in <coughs> rabbinate in Australia. So I'd like your, your take on that, and uh, how are they dealing with the new uh, winds of uh, feminism and things, things of that sort. And one last question. Uh, you know that uh, the Australian government is finally going to face its last test in terms of Nazi war criminals, the case of Charles Zentai, and I'd like uh, your prediction or your take whether or not he'll actually be extradited from Australia to Hungary to stand trial. I like the fact if rhyme starts with the easy questions. Always, <laughs> you, you know, you, on India and China, Izzy is a much better place than I am to talk about it. He yeah. played the leadership no, no, role. I, know, I, know. Uh, yeah. I was a spectator in those, in those areas. Uh, and if Izzy wants to answer, though, yeah, yeah, if, yeah, if not, but we can look at what's happening more recently, and that is Indonesia, Vietnam, right. yeah, which yeah. things are happening right now. Um, doing, yeah, that's what yeah, the yeah. Australian Israel Jewish Affairs Council, uh, often but not always in conjunction with the American Jewish Committee, has been identifying important uh, leaders, opinion leaders, <coughs> scholars, bureaucrats, politicians in places like uh, Thailand, the Philippines, and now even Indonesia, right. uh, Vietnam, and getting them to Israel on missions, or in the worst case scenario, getting them to Australia to meet with the Australian Jewish community and develop a relationship. I, I can tell you, I don't know what will come of this, but to me it's the most amazing thing that happened. It only happened on Friday. I haven't had time really to deal with it. In the largest Muslim political party in the world is one of two parties, there's an argument. One is the NU, the party of Abdurrahman Wahid, who I think, if he's not here now, will be in the next couple of days. Uh, or the number two party in Indonesia, the Muhammadiyah. There's an argument which one is larger. They've each got 35 to 40 million members, Muslim political parties. These are our immediate neighbours to our north. Historically, Wahid's party has been far more interested in relations with the West, far more liberal, and Wahid himself very openly uh, interested in meeting Jews and understanding better whatever. The Muhammadiyah had been uh, more interested in uh, hosting the president of Iran, whoever it might be, building a, 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 not necessarily confrontational with the West, but their international relations focus had not been Western or Jewish oriented. I received an invitation. I personally received an invitation as the Australian Israel Jewish Affairs Council, because I wear a number of hats, it's important it was in the title, to address their main conference uh, next month in June, in Jakarta, on the global, on, on the contribution of religions to overcoming violence, is the theme of their conference. Now, I don't, you know, obviously you have to give a lot of thought into something like that. But the fact it's offered, the fact that Mohammedia would, it, to, it, I, it, it's amazed me, and I, I really don't know, you know, where, where it will go. But it's part of the process of trying to find ways of just being in their space, being present, and being able to develop some sort of a relationship. The Australian government, uh, and the, on the suggestion of the Executive Council of Australian Jury, actually, instituted the Asian Regional Interfaith Dialogue, where delegations from now 15 countries meet each year. And the idea was that you would try and strengthen the hand of people who want to use religion as a force for cooperation and dialogue against those who want religion as a force for division. But I'm worried that unless this new government gets it right, it's lost the plot a little bit about the, the importance of that dialogue. But I can say, I'm looking, I, I took part in the second and third dialogues, they're, they're now up to number four, and it was just remarkable, because I was the only person wearing the apart. It was non-stop, people coming and wanting to ask questions in that environment that they would be, a be afraid to ask elsewhere. So that's something we're doing in the Asian region. I've voyaged into China. Uh, the role of Chabad. Look, I can't say a word about Chabad, because whenever I do, I get into trouble. Even when, I, <laughs> when I'm trying to be nice, when I'm trying to be critical, if I mention anything to do with them, I get a fax immediately. There'll be one in my hotel already for my answer to this question. <laughs> I'm about by someone in Australia saying they heard something which I never said and, I, and telling me why I have to apologise. So I really can't go into depth on that, but I can say that one of the challenges for the Australian Jewish community has been finding rabbis, or certainly we're not producing rabbis, who represent where the, where the community seems to be at the time. And it's been extremely difficult uh, because 
uh, people from the Chabad movement have been willing to work longer hours for less money in uh, small communities, and often the smaller synagogues have uh, found them to be an attractive uh, way of meeting their needs. Uh, even some of the larger synagogues, for generally budgetary reasons, not for religious choice reasons, have uh, chosen to have people from the Chabad background. One thing I can say, though, is uh, there's a joke that there's a group called the Plain Clothes Chabad, who were actually educated through Chabad institutions, but due to their acculturation in their own communities, uh, you wouldn't necessarily know where they're coming from. Like, uh, I go to a synagogue where once a year the rabbi tells us we're all going to be transported now, uh, magically when the Mashiach comes next week, and he does his one sort of Chabad speech a year, but the rest of the time, you know, you know, he, the, the synagogue indulges him a little bit. It might be more than one, but it's not a lot more than one. Uh, there, are, there are others who you would not know. Sometimes I say you wouldn't even know they're Jewish. I mean, the content of the Drosh's is the public affairs agenda of the day. Mm. And so it doesn't become that important. And one of the most interesting people I work with in interfaith dialogue is a person who is actually Chabad. Uh, and what happened is a Catholic priest came to him. Uh, sit, he was sitting in a center, which doubles as a synagogue for 12 people. And the, uh, the uh, Catholic priest wanted to talk to him about Judaism and Christianity. And they brought a Muslim partner. And now for the past four or five years, they've been going to schools to speak to 11 and 12 year olds around Australia about living with people of other religions positively. Now, he's a Lubavitch. And he is somebody that I would say, despite being a Lubavitch rabbi, is able to play a very important constructive role in outreach in the community. When you mention other questions, it's not, uh, you, when you mention women's issues or whatever, yeah, it, there's, there's a huge variety within the orthodox uh, traditional Orthodox, let alone the Hasidic groups, about how they deal with those issues. And I think we find individuals probably have more influence on what happens. I'm just saying, my than sense was that there was a tremendous gap between the Kila and, and the yeah. Rabbanim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes that's, we, we yeah. joke, sometimes that's our choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I do take your point, and it is a problem to try and work out it's also a question of producing what happens to rabbis. producing rabbis of the world. Yeah, of finding it's people. a worldwide problem. But, yeah. uh, but I found some outstanding people. I was with, uh, yeah. in, in the March of the Living, the rabbi from South Caulfield Shul, uh, Ralph Ganenda, a major congregation now in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, he's from Zimbabwe originally, South African trained. Perfect mix with the Australian community. There are others I've come across, again, they're not Australian born though, from England and America right. sometimes, yeah. have been great. Your third question about what will happen with Nazi war criminals, Zen Charles Zen 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 particular. Zen but it, it, just to, it, the, the case is complicated, obviously. Basically, uh, a strong case exists for those who don't know that uh, a man by the name of Charles Zentai, uh, well, he's actually been a trial, he's been found guilty already of murder as a member of the Arrow Cross, it's, sorry, not the Arrow Cross, Army. Hungarian mm -hmm. Army, sorry, yeah. during, the, during the Shoah, and uh, an issue related to his extradition, and we've been through every level of the courts to decide whether Australia, whether a, a local magistrate of the power or whatever to do with the extradition. His legal team has been fighting tooth and nail in a democratic legal system like Australia. And I can tell you, I've been involved in a racial hatred case in Australia, which isn't complicated, which has been going 10 years, just because there are so many layers, state, federal, single bench, multi-bench, appeals, whatever. And uh, Charles Zentai is also doing what he can to delay any possibility of his extradition until he dies safely in his bed the way some of his... Uh, other Nazi war criminals in Australia have. Question uh, is whether the Labour government will sign off on the extradition. I think the Labour government would do exactly what the Liberal government would have, and that is they would sign off on the they extradition. I think they would, but it's going to be determined by the by the lower courts about the, the, the time schedule before it gets to the, the government finally. Uh, one of the things that we argued, I mean, if Ryan and I were both in the media not knowing we were saying it, but saying the same thing from the very beginning, that if he was innocent, he would want the matter dealt with immediately. Which he said originally. Yeah, he would like to deal with it. Yeah, and and we think, yeah, it's important. Let's deal with it. But as soon as the process starts, it's taking as long as he can to have the matter dealt with at all. So I'm not that confident. Yeah. Uh, what, one of the, uh, I want to thank you for your comments. One of the uh, unique aspects of Australia also is that Australia recognizes Jerusalem as being part of Israel. Uh, our grandson, who's about the year and three or four months old, who is also an Australian citizen, uh, was born in East Jerusalem in Harat Sophim, and on his Australian citizenship paper, 
uh, with the emu and uh, kangaroo. It has his name and it says, uh, uh, right through inheritance, because my daughter-in-law is Australian. It's a mistake that... And it says, Jerusalem, Israel. And uh, we checked uh, with passports, Australian passports. Uh, Australian passports do not put countries. They only put the city of birth. So it says, Jerusalem, uh, without Israel. At first, they said, ah, it was a mistake. And uh, in verification, uh, Australian Citizen, any Australian citizen is born in Jerusalem, is born in Jerusalem, Israel, unlike Canada or the United States. I think there are going to be variations in how clerical staff deal with these yeah. matters. I know someone recently who was born in Haifano country. Haifano country. So, uh, you know, yeah. you have to... Uh, well, no, I, I'm just don't saying, burst my bubble. Be nice. I, I'm sorry to burst your bubble of Australia yes. temporarily, unless you think it's a great thing that we have bureaucrats who are going to uh, yes. act independently. On our side. <laughs> On our side, yeah. I've, I've heard you speak about the, the, stand, stand stand the inner Jewish community, and I'm wondering if uh, Australia has something to what America has, perhaps, where they have conservative reconstructionists, uh, these kind of synagogues besides the orthodox synagogue, no matter how you view the orthodox synagogue. And secondly, can you tell me something about uh, the kosher facilities in Australia? Do they have, for example, kosher hotels and kosher butchers? Is that enough for everybody, or are there some problems with kosher in Australia? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, all right, when it comes down to the religious spread, the majority of synagogues in Australia would be orthodox of one variety or another, which would spread to what you might want to call conservadox, which would be a conservative synagogue, except they follow a singer's prayer book and the men and women sit separately, but there's nothing otherwise you would say it's not even a right-wing conservative American synagogue that was conducted, it's through to mainly Chabad, but even some other Hasidic <coughs> people or whatever around. Uh, then a probably a quarter of the, so that would be the majority, a quarter, maybe a little more, uh, certainly in terms of members, but not synagogues, because they tend to be larger, would affiliate with the progressive movement, which inf includes reform and liberal. And progressive, it's not all of the one sort. Uh, one of the progressive synagogues has opened a conservative synagogue on its premises, for those who want to use a conservative uh, uh, prayer book. And in Melbourne, there's a conservative synagogue as well. But it's, it's, it's much more, I think, the number's probably quite close to Great Britain in terms of the, the synagogue people don't go to except on Yom Kippur is uh, orthodox. And uh, if it, when it comes to burials, whatever, again, probably three quarters would want to be buried by the orthodox uh, rabbinate, a quarter by the reformed progressive rabbinate. Um, and there's a little movement. I mean, there are people who will move between conservative, orthodox, and reform on a regular basis during a year. It's not uh, necessarily a warlike stand between one stream and another. Uh, Kashrut's an interesting issue. Uh, at various times, it goes up and down what's available, shall we say. Uh, in Sydney, there is not at the moment a kosher hotel. There are very few kosher facilities. If you like your Peter and your Schwama or unique Australian delicacies like that, we have two or three kosher places in Sydney, uh, a couple of delis, that's it, in terms of take uh, food available. But a number of our major supermarkets have a lot of kosher food products identified separately, so it uh, is available. Melbourne is more kashrut. I think there's still, is Kimberley still kosher? I don't know. I, yeah, well, uh, they, still they, they, re they reopened. They reopened. Re yeah, but for a while they weren't, is what I'm saying. Yeah, there's one, yeah, yeah. there's been and it's gone. Yeah. There aren't kosher hotels now in other places. Yeah. But, uh, but, but kosher foods, are, but basically it's available. It's much, it's much easier now than, once, than it was a few years ago. Uh, but the society's changed also. It used to be if you wanted to buy meat wherever you were, you went to your butcher. Now more people buy their meat from supermarkets. Include, including the kosher meat from the kosher supermarket. Society is changed that Stuart Stone. Uh, one of the interesting elements of your presentation was you made mention of the fact that the, um, the Israeli immigration into Australia has, it would seem to have been incorporated into a wider Australian Jewish community. Um, I come from London, and one of the upsetting factors about British Jewish society is that the of the 70,000 or so reputed number of Israelis stated to be living in the London area, um, a fraction of them, a very small fraction, would identify with the English Jewish community. What is there about your, your approach to Israelis that, see, that seems to have 
been succeeded in incorporating them into the wider Australian Jewish activity? Okay, well first, it, there was a period up to, I would say, probably even only 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that, where one of the big challenges was having Israelis involved in the community in any way whatsoever. Israelis who came to Australia who were religious or had family, yes, not a problem. Israelis who came because they wanted to get away from the tension of the Middle East to a country like Australia, or they didn't want to think of themselves as anything other than a citizen of the world, but a very easy to disappear into the Australian landscape. And it's difficult to know how many fitted those categories. And, a pro and one of the big problems many Israelis who might have not been sure exactly where they sat was Australia being a very Zionist community. And it was a, a, an insulting attitude towards Israelis who had left Israel to live in Australia, when the community itself was very involved in at least thinking of itself as very Zionist in terms of its fundraising, its mindset at least. But uh, a couple of things have changed. First, we have uh, governments funded Jewish radio programs, including in the Hebrew language, which informs the, the Israelis who want to hear what's going on to, in the world in Australia in Hebrew, tune into a channel which is related to the community and will tell them what's going on and, and encourage people. Community-wide Hanukkah celebrations in particular more than anything else, and Sederim, but Hanukkah more than anything else, huge crowds of Israelis find it useful to still have a connection with the broader community as long as they don't feel they're going to be alienated from this, from this group. That's those who are living in areas where there, are, where there are Jews in the Jewish community. There's also, I think, the consciousness of the Australian Jewish community in more recent days that if you've lived in Israel, and I'm not saying I share it or whatever, but a general view. If you've lived in Israel and you've come to live in Australia, it doesn't make you a bad person running away. It means you're somebody who might have a level of Hebrew knowledge that you don't have and you want to share, or you start talking about experiences of family and they're seen as more normal than they would have been a generation earlier. But the last point is, and it's something that relates to uh, Ephraim's comment earlier in a way, and that is Chabad have made a huge effort to go out to places where there was no organized Jewish activity and create facilities. And in one area, in uh, Australia is organized by a number of states and territories. The state in which Sydney is the capital is New South Wales. In the northern part of New South Wales, it's the area where the hippie commune